Hi friends! Welcome to our unit on the periodic table and chemical bonding. And so this is going to be our introduction to the periodic table. But before we get into that, I think you know where we're going. We're going to go take a look at the overall course presentation and just see where we are in the overall structure of the course. So let's go over there. So remember that our overall theme for the year is that matter is made of atoms and that atoms interact in interesting ways. And so up to now, we've been looking at groups of atoms doing things in mass and our physical behavior of matter units. And then we went in and we looked at the actual atomic structure. Now let's look at how the elements are arranged and some of the themes that we see in elements and how they bond with each other. So that's bringing us into this section of the course. And here in unit six, we're gonna deal with the periodic table and bonding and get a handle on both of these things before we start to see the combinations in reactions and compounds that we're gonna spend the rest of our year looking at. Cool, let's go back to the presentation. So let's go in and take a look at this periodic table and see how it works. So this is the periodic table that you have in your reference tables, and it's the one that we're mostly going to reference over the course of this year. We've actually already been referencing it uh, up to now. Remember that there is a key in the middle, and so that key gives you all sorts of information about what you see in each box using carbon as an example. Uh, the periodic table was originally developed by Dmitry Mendeleev, who is a Russian chemist, and Lothar Meyer. And they had discovered that by arranging elements according to atomic mass, that certain properties of the elements repeated in intervals or periodically. This is one of Mendeleev's original tables. There were gaps when they first discovered this. And based on the periodic properties, Mendeleev was able to make some predictions about what those missing elements should look like that were then borne out when those elements were discovered later on. So that's why he gets a lot of the credit for the development of the periodic table. Of course, he did arrange everything by mass, and that's not really how things are done on the modern periodic table. So the modern periodic table is arranged by atomic number, or the number of protons that the atoms have. And this arrangement was really formalized by Henry Moseley, who was a British chemist, who set this all up and then volunteered to go fight in World War I and was unfortunately killed almost immediately prior to when he probably would have won a Nobel Prize for doing this work. But that's how the modern table is arranged, and so we should give Henry Moseley some credit. He, uh, he did not live very long, but he burned bright during his life. So in looking at the periodic table, uh, we have this notion of the periodic law, which means that the physical and chemical properties of elements will recur in regular intervals as the atomic number increases. The periodic table itself is broken up into seven rows, which we call periods, and every element in a row has the same number of principal energy levels for its electrons. It's also broken up into 18 columns, which are called groups, and every element in a group has the same number of valence electrons. It actually turns out that that number of valence electrons is really important, and that elements with the same number of valence electrons behave very similarly chemically when they bond with other elements. In terms of how the elements were named, you know, the internet's got all sorts of information about the history of elements. Many of them have been known for thousands of years. Many of them have only been discovered in the last hundred years. The symbology that we use is to write a capital letter or a capital letter followed by a lowercase letter. There are some placeholder names down at the bottom which use one capital and two lowercase letters. We could talk more about how that's done in class. For the most part, the element symbol has something to do with its name but there are some exceptions. And so there are some remnant symbols which are given to you in your unit six packet on page six. And I put them all here for you so you can check them out if you want. A lot of them come from like their ancient Roman names. So for instance, uh, gold comes from the Latin aurum, which means shining dawn. And mercury comes from hydrogyrum, which means liquid silver, which has to do with the properties of mercury. But for the most part, the symbols do have something in common with the names. When we look at the elements, there are many different ways of breaking them up. Sort of the most fundamental way is classifying them as metals, metalloids, or non-metals. If we look at our periodic table, you can see that there's this bold line separating the periodic table into two groups. That separates the metals from the non-metals. The metals are going to be on the left, and the non-metals are going to be on the right. The metalloids, elements that have intermediate properties between metals and non-metals, are actually going to be found on that bold line. Boron, silicon, germanium, arsenic, antimony, tellurium, and astatine are your seven metalloids. Aluminum and polonium are also on that line, but they are classified as metals for the most part because of how they behave. Another way to think about it is in terms of the phases of the elements. So at room temperature, most of them are solids. There are, however, two liquids, bromine and mercury. Bromine is a non-metal and mercury is a metal. And there are 10 gases. Hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, and everything in group 18. Now, if you ever forget this, you can always go to reference table S to help yourself out. Reference table S lists the melting points and boiling points of the different elements. And so remember that if room temperature, 298 degrees Kelvin approximately, is 
above the element's boiling point, then that element is going to be a gas. But if it's in between its melting point and its boiling point, then that element is going to be a liquid. If, of course, it's below its melting point, then it's going to be a solid. Another way to think about the elements is how they occur naturally. Very few elements occur by themselves naturally, though there are a couple examples. Most elements occur in compounds. Some of the elements that do occur by themselves occur as gases. So there are monatomic gases. All of the group 18 elements, because of their electron configurations, do not bond. And so they're known as the noble gases. They all exist in single atom units. There are also some diatomic elements, which would be bromine, iodine, nitrogen, chlorine, hydrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. Because of these elements' electron configurations, they very frequently pair up with each other. The easiest way to remember these seven diatomic molecules is just to spell out the name that gets made when you put all of their symbols together, which is Brinkelhoff. If you remember Brinkelhoff, you'll always have the seven diatomic molecules. While we're on the subject of the naturally occurring forms of elements, there are several elements that occur in different forms naturally. Different forms of an element that have different atomic structures would be called allotropes. And as a result of having different atomic structures, they're going to have different physical properties and chemical properties. A classic example is O2 and O3. O2, diatomic oxygen, is the oxygen that you breathe every time you take a breath. O3, or ozone, is actually toxic and would kill you if you breathe too much of it. So you don't want to breathe too much of it at all. It's produced through pollution and it exists uh, somewhat stably at the very outer boundary of our atmosphere in the ozone layer. Another good example of an allotrope, classic example, are the diamond and graphite forms of carbon. They're both made out of carbon, but they're bonded together in different ways. And so as a result, one is on my wife's finger and the other one I can use when I'm taking a Scantron test. Right? Two very, very different substances with very, very different physical and chemical properties, all because those atoms, which are the same element in this case, put together in two very, very different ways. These are not the only two allotropes, but it's a good example to get your head around this concept. When we look at the periodic table, the groups have characteristic names. This periodic table will actually show you the names of most of the groups. The ones that you need to know are the ones that are circled here in blue. There's really no easy way around this. You just kind of have to stare at them until you get familiar with them. We're gonna do an activity in class where we look at example elements from each of these groups in order to help us get a handle on them. But I've also linked to the periodic table of videos below this lesson. And if you go there, you can click on any element on the periodic table and learn all you wanna learn about it, which isn't a bad idea to start to get a handle on these different groups. Every group on the periodic table has specific characteristics, and these are the characteristics of the groups that you need to be most familiar with. This is given to you on a chart on page seven of your unit six packet. I would definitely encourage you to take a moment and look at this chart, but we're not gonna go over that over the course of this video. It's just not a good use of our time. We'll deal with it in class. Still, if you do take a look at it and you have any questions, now would be a good time to write them down before we move on. Another thing to understand about the periodic table is that we see periodicity in the ions that elements form. The group that an element occurs in is going to dictate the kind of ions that it can form. So for instance, elements in group one with their one valence electron will lose that valence electron to form a plus one ion. Elements in group two will lose their two to form a plus two. In group 13, they have three valence electrons and they'll lose them to form plus three. Once we get to group 14, we could either gain or lose four electrons. And then once we're past that into groups 15, 16, and 17, we're going to gain three, two, or one electrons to form negative three, negative two, or negative one ions. That's why the elements in a group are chemically similar. Because they have the same number of valence electrons, they're going to bond or gain or lose electrons in the same way. Group 18, of course, has a stable valence configuration and so isn't going to gain or lose any electrons, generally is not going to bond. The other thing that we talked about in our last unit was the notion that the periodic table is arranged by electron filling order when we talk about expanded electron configurations. And you can see that here. We've got our S block, our P block, our D block, and our F block. If that doesn't make a lot of sense to you, that's really okay. But I figured we would talk about it here for a moment just to remind us that the periodic table just gives us so much information about the elements all expressed in that one small table. Thanks so much for watching our introduction to the periodic table. Take a moment here at the end and make sure you can do the following. Make sure that you have some familiarity with the periodic characteristics of the elements that were discussed in this video. Make sure that you can identify an element as a metal, a metalloid, or a non-metal. Make sure that you can identify the solid, liquid, and gaseous elements at room temperature. Also make sure that you can identify the monatomic, diatomic, and allotropic forms of elements. If you can do those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too.
Take a moment and write down any questions that you have. You can always leave them for me in the comments below the video, or you can always get in touch with me through the information in the info field. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.